Hi, I'm Jake. I am the business manager and one of the photographers here at Wilder Weddings Collective. And thank you so much for joining us in our first ever webinar uh, in a series that we're calling uh, Wedding Photography as a Business. This is the lesson, How to Price Yourself as a Wedding Photographer, and it's the 101 intro level lesson. Um, if you find this video helpful, if you find some value in it, just let us know in the comments below. We're conducting a little bit of market research here, testing the waters, and uh, if you all find it helpful, then uh, we'll continue on in the series. But most of all, thanks for tuning in, thanks for listening. And um, before we get into the meat of the video, uh, I do have just a couple of quick disclaimers that I wanted to throw out there so we're all on the on a level, level playing field. So first off, um, some of you might have heard this info before, some of you maybe are already implementing it, some of you may disagree with it. That's all cool. Uh, we're not trying to say that our word is law here, I'm just conveying my experience, um, mine and, and Carolyn's experience. So. Between the two of us, we have about 20 years in the wedding industry, um, and we just were feeling like it was time to put some of that out there and, and maybe help some other folks. Um, <clears throat> I'll also be giving taxes a wide berth during this video, so I'm not a tax professional, and you can get into some legal hot water if you uh, advise folks um, in, the, in inappropriate ways. So uh, I'll be uh, giving those a wide berth. In fact, the best thing that you can do for you and your business is to hire a certified professional accountant. They can actually help you get the most back on your taxes, so um, th they'll be able to help you infinitely more than I ever will on that subject. Um, and finally, the the most helpful thing uh, that I think I've found in pursuing business is that um, it's it's all like apart from laws and taxes, it's all just made up. <laughs> And, and I, I say that to hopefully help that be an empowering fact, um, but it, it's all just an exercise in probability. So anyone that comes to you and says, if you do this, you can definitely charge this and the market will 100% of the time pay you that amount for that service. Um, I think that's just not like, that's just not possible. I haven't, I haven't run into that yet. Uh, and I don't know anyone else that has either. And so uh, if you are like me and you find yourself stuck in the analysis paralysis stage, just um, play that little reminder that it's all an exercise in probabilities. We're all just faking it till we make it. Uh, and in fact, I think humans have been doing that for millennia. So <laughs> just join the train. You're in good company. Um, the, the most important thing you can do is just have a reason why you're doing what you're doing. If that reason proves not to be correct, no worries. Go back. We'll fix it. We'll test a new one. And the, the our world keeps, keeps spinning, baby, so <laughs> let's do it. Um, so the question, how do you price yourself? Um, this question plagues pretty much every entrepreneur and especially folks that are in a service-based business because there's a feeling of I'm selling someone my time, right? Uh, and I've got uh, what feels like an infinite amount of that, especially when you're just getting started. You're like, I got so much time. You can just take it. I'll work for free. There's an argument to be made for that case, um, but I, I, in order to do this at a sustainable rate, you'll find that you, you have to charge something. Um, and so how do you come up with that number? Uh, well, we, we have a formula that we've used for years that is, has helped us kind of get some ballpark numbers, and then actually it has kind of some after effects too. But so that formula uh, goes a little something like this, and we'll have a slide up on the screen here. So it is desired yearly revenue, divided by desired number of weddings equals your average price per wedding. So let's break that down a little bit further. That word revenue, um, again, this, some folks know this, some folks don't, no worries either way. Uh, this you, you might also hear revenue called sales. Um, in this instance, you can break revenue down into like teeny tiny little detailed parts. For the sake of this video today, we're gonna break revenue down into um, desired yearly take home pay. So that's like what you put in your pocket over the course of the year, uh, plus projected expenses. Um, we're going to define each of those terms later, but we're, we're kind of laying the groundwork here. So breaking it down further, desired yearly take home pay plus projected expenses all over desired number of weddings equals your target average price per wedding. And uh, some people might say, okay, yeah, that's, that's great. I could never charge that. And uh, you're right. Um, no, <laughs> obviously just kidding. Uh, but I think that that like that internal feeling of like, well, I could never, there's no way the, the, you know, people would never pay that. That is, uh, very normal. Um, uh, that's a feeling that we feel consistently, but we also have to remind ourselves that, um, 
that may not always be the case. So the market does get a vote. And sometimes the market actually votes more in your favor than you're even willing to admit. Um, but on the chance that it doesn't, and, and the chance that that target average price per year is higher than the market is willing to accept, um, this exercise is still helpful for three reasons. So, so first, it gives you something to shoot for. So you know a target, you know if you are making progress towards that target. Second, it hopefully um, helps you realize just how close that goal is, which uh, can be really encouraging. And when we do this exercise and we find that the, the space between our target and where we're currently at is shrinking, um, that just really drives uh, us to, to do more, to provide better and better service, to market ourselves more, all these different things that you can do to kind of drive up demand. Uh, and finally, um, doing this exercise will help you start generating those ideas on how to close that gap between target and current. Um, and you'll see me checking my notes here periodically just to make sure that I cover each point as diligently as possible. So um, with those things in mind, the, the, the reasoning behind why we do this exercise, uh, with those in mind, let's break down each piece of that puzzle. So um, we already kind of talked about how revenue is just sales. It's, it's all the money coming into your business. It's everything that the market has elected to give you in exchange for your goods and services. Great. Um, now we need to take that revenue and actually split it apart, right? So um, the first part is your desired yearly pay. Uh, and this one, I, I'm going to stay away from specific numbers here because it's your life and, and you know what is going to work best for you. The caveat that I wanted to uh, dive into here, or rather the tangent I wanted to take here, just, just briefly, because I think some folks might be at this point, we definitely have been. Um, there, uh, so I want to speak to folks that are maybe like working a full-time job, like a nine to five and doing wedding photography on the side, and you would love to flip that, right? Have it be the inverse or maybe even just kick that nine to five to the curb, be full-time wedding photography. Uh, and you're kind of trying to figure out how to do that. We'll, we'll cover that more in depth in another video, but this is a great place to lay the foundation for that. So that desired yearly pay, what you want your business to make for you. Um, <clears throat> one way that you can make that transition sooner from part-time to full-time is that you can reduce how much you're, how much you need from your business, right? So this is where it comes down to personal finance. Um, th these are some choices that Carolyn and I have made over the years to require less from our business, um, so that we can rely on it fully. If that makes sense. So we, we drove our personal expenses further and further down by doing things like um, we were we were blessed to be able to buy a home in, here in Asheville, and but we we chose an older home that was an estate sale. We actually had a great real estate agent who found a great deal for us. Uh, but this home needed two to three years of TLC to like really make it feel like ours. And that was fine. That was the price we were willing to pay. Um, we pay cash for our cars and I've logged so many hours on YouTube University learning how to maintain those, those suckers. Um, but that means that we don't have a car payment every month. We pay insurance, um, but we, we're not, you know, we're not paying interest on a car loan. Um, I give up, uh, and I mean, our, our family gives up a month and a half of my time away from home uh, every year for Air Force Reserve service. Uh, and that yields us some highly subsidized uh, federal health insurance, which is massive. Um, I say all those things not to say, like, this is what you should do. I totally get it. Not everyone is able to do that or willing to do that or, or that, that is not in line with their values. I'm not prescribing. I'm just uh, giving examples of ways in which we lowered our, our personal expenses which means that that desired yearly pay, we could actually keep that fairly low, especially early on, which also meant that we required less from our business. And that meant that we could then shift more and more attention. Like we could, we could make the switch, right? We don't need the business to make us that much. So we can, we can go ahead and switch to full time in the business and then devote all of that extra time towards uh, ramping up the, the revenue generating activities in the business and providing better service to marketing ourselves uh, more and better, to improving our skills as photographers, to, you know, you name it. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, I, I'm not trying to deny the fact that we have been severely, uh, that's, a, that's a weird word, we have been exceedingly blessed in life. Um, and I, I know that not everybody's experience is the same, but that's, that's kind of where we're coming from. And hopefully that helps uh, kind of describe the underlying concept. Okay, so, um, and actually, real quick, another side, the other thing that really gets me pumped up is if you can maintain low expenses, 
and now you switch to full time, and your business is really ramping up, and you're making more and more money, but your expenses maintain that low level, like where you started. It creeps up a little bit, but generally you're keeping a lock on that. Soon, the in- income from your business far outpaces the expenses, and you can reinvest that into other assets that are going to make money for you while you're not even paying attention to them. And if you do enough of that to the point where it covers that low personal expenses, you're financially free. That's what retirement is, which I didn't know until several years ago, and it blew my mind when I did. Uh, Obviously, I get excited about this. If you want to split a six-pack and hang out with me on our back porch and uh, talk about personal financial independence uh, and just dream about that, I'm freaking into it. So uh, anyway, sidetrack. Here we go. Back into the formula. So we're defining each of these terms. We defined uh, desired yearly pay. We defined, well, we defined, we started off with revenue. We broke that down into pay and expenses. Uh, expenses is the other piece. And this is less uh, fun a lot of times to talk about because it's outflowing as opposed to incoming, but uh, it is crucial to this whole equation. So expenses uh, can be broken down into a number of categories. We'll do it into two. One of which uh, we're going to call cost of goods sold. That's uh, It's kind of an older term, but it helps capture, it's, it's common language amongst bookkeepers and accountants. Um, and that is essentially defined as the amount of money it costs you to produce one extra unit. And a unit in this case will be a wedding. Um, we, for a long time, didn't really track how much it actually cost us to shoot a wedding. We figured, okay, we bought the camera, we'll chop that up and uh, put the total gear price over all the weddings we ever shoot with that gear. And But otherwise, it's like, what, it's just our time. False. Uh, it actually is also things like batteries. It's things like um, hard drives. If you shoot a ton and you are backing up everything, um, you end up using like two thirds of a hard drive almost on a on an individual wedding if you're saving the raws and whatnot. Um, it is things like uh, gas to and from the the wedding, wear and tear in your cars, especially if you're shooting like an hour away. You know, normal drives, you know, 10, 15 minutes, whatever. That's not a big deal. But if you're shooting an hour and a half away once or twice a week, that starts to add up pretty significantly. Um, There's there's so many other things that go into that cost of goods sold, but it it needs to be tracked. And you don't have to get it perfect, just get a ballpark. Um, So that is, again, cost of goods sold, that's the amount that it costs you out of your own pocket to shoot a wedding. The other bundle of expenses we'll call keeping the lights on. um, In bookkeeping parlance, it's like SGNA, it's sales, general, and administration. But that's all the things that, whether you're shooting weddings or not, you're going to pay these things. So that is paying for your website, that is paying for software subscriptions, that is paying for, uh, you could you could put gear feasibly in this category. You could, um, <clears throat> if you rent a co-working space, again, it's, it's any, any expense that occurs for your business, but is not dependent on the number of units you produce, if that makes sense. It's not dependent on the number of weddings that you shoot. So that's our two categories of expenses. Um, We're gonna project those out for the year. And again, you don't have to be perfect if if you are like me and you wanna get it just right down to the cent. Um, You can, if that really kind of revs your engine, but if if it doesn't and it stresses you out like me, uh, then just just estimate it. Give us a ballpark. If you're plus plus or minus 10%, generally there's gonna be enough margin uh, for you to make that up. We talked about revenue. We said revenue was split into your take-home pay and your expenses. We talked about expenses being broken down into um, what it costs you on a per wedding basis, those individual costs, and what it costs you on a yearly basis just to keep the lights on. We're estimating all of those things and we're adding them together. So that's the top portion of our formula. The bottom portion of that formula is desired weddings per year. so this one is near and dear to our hearts uh, because the, I think especially early on, there's this feeling, I mean, there's a, it's, you know, first off, the business is fun. Like it's, it's just fun being a wedding photographer. Uh, it, it comes with its own stresses and whatnot, but it's great. You get to meet so many great folks. You get to be a part of such uh, an intense emotional uh, day. You get to capture memories for them that in, in some way you're going to be part of their family for, for years and years and years. And that's incredible. Um, so, doing that as often as possible is great. Um, What we found though, as the years went by, uh, like in, so it really came to a head for us in 2016. 
Um, Carolyn shot uh, 40 weddings that year by herself. That was, there was there was no other team at that point. I was second shooting, um, you know, some of them, but everything, all sales calls, all wedding planning, all shooting took place uh, in in Carolyn's time. And um, she, you know, we we strive to provide just, I mean, essentially to to love and honor each couple's day uh, as if it was our own. Like it's, it is their, you know, for most folks, it's their first wedding. They're, they're not sure what's going on. They're, they're trying to plan to the best of their ability. Uh, and they'll, they'll come to their photographer for guidance. A lot of times, um, each of those couples deserves your utmost attention, you know? And, um, what we found that year is that Carolyn was like reaching kind of her breaking point. She was able to provide that level of service, but it was driving her crazy. Uh, and it, it had physical ramifications by like the beginning of fall 2016. She was literally losing so much hair that we went to the doctor and the doc was like, yeah, bro, you just got to slow down. Like you're, you're doing, you're doing too much, man. Um, so when it comes to setting that desired number of weddings for us, like I said, it's near and dear to our hearts. What we found is that generally on the year that ends up being uh around 20 weddings um again that's not prescriptive we're not trying to say that is the golden number you should do that what we found is that for our work-life balance um that that has worked best we shoot about 20 caroline our our other shooting team uh, she shoots about 20 per year and uh, we found that to be best because it enables us to uh, provide the the care and attention and respect and um just really, I mean, like touch points that the, that each of these weddings deserves. Each of these couples deserves to have their day uh, treated as the, the special and, and kind of sacred thing that it is. So w- with that number, 20, 20 weddings per year for us, that's where we find the, the most success. Um, and finally, that yields your average price per wedding. So that one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, that's just kind of, if you could shoot, you know, your desired number of weddings at this price, you'll hit your revenue goal for the year. And that'll give you your desired take-home pay. Uh, assuming your estimates are pretty close, you'll hit all your expenses. Bada bing, bada boom, you know, you've priced yourself. Um, there's uh, a whole world of nuance into the different levels of packages that you offer and, and you know, price anchoring. And, and there's a lot of different things that you can think about on that end of the spectrum. And we'll get into that probably in, in later videos. But for today, that's that's the piece that we wanted to cover. We want to come up with a target. Um, so the the final thing that I'll say is, remember I, I mentioned earlier that the market gets a vote. So if you're saying to yourself, "There's no way I could charge that much," um, you know, you, you may be, you may be right, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, the the difference between what you can charge or what what you're currently charging and the target price uh, that should help generate ideas as to how to close that gap. Um, if you are wondering, okay, well, what I'm currently charging is lower than my target price. How do I know if I can bump that up? Um, there's no hard and fast rules, but, uh, what we found from our experience is that the key metric is the booking rate. So that is all of the inquiries that come in, uh, and that is measuring, uh, the number of those that booked. So we'll take the number of inquiries that booked divided by the total number of inquiries, which is really hard to say for some reason, and that will give you your booking rate. If you find that you are, uh, we, we generally find that if we're holding at about 30%, we're, we're doing good. We can hit our numbers for the year. Uh, we're not gonna raise or lower, we're just right down the middle. Um, if we start inching above that, if we're, if we're pushing 35, 40, 50% of our inquiries, if they're booking, um, we find that that to us indicates it's time to raise our prices how much and when and all of that sort of stuff is also more nuanced and, and things that we can get into in a later video. But generally that 30% rule is kind of what we're looking for. If you're not booking at the 30% rate, but you're hitting your target numbers, good on you. Hey, keep doing what you're doing. Maybe you're getting a ton of inquiries and you only need to book a certain percentage of them. Um, if you are not, if you are booking lower than 30% and not hitting your revenue goals, uh, it might be time to reshape your packages, maybe rethink what you're offering. Maybe uh, you need to revisit your kind of sales process. Maybe sales calls uh, might work better than sales emails or, or vice versa. Um, there's any number of things and, and that stuff we would love to talk to you about and, and get into in a later video. But um, the market does get a vote. 
Uh, generally, we find if it's voting 30% or higher, then uh, we're good to either stay steady or, or raise a bit. Uh, but that's, that's us. So, in conclusion, uh, we looked at the formula today that was desired yearly revenue over desired number of weddings equals your target price. And <clears throat> we broke revenue down into yearly expenses and, uh, or I'm sorry, yearly take home pay and uh, cost of goods sold that like one, one unit costs plus the keeping the lights on expenses uh, all over desired number of weddings equals your target price. We said that the market gets a vote. Um, so if you can, uh, if you're someone who's trying to get out of wedding photography as a kind of side hustle and make it your full-time thing, if you can drive your desired yearly pay down, your, as I say desired, but it might be required, right? Because you need to, you need to pay bills and stuff. If you can drive that required yearly pay down, you can make that switch sooner. Um, <clears throat> you can always iterate. So if you are, if you want to try uh, testing a certain price point on a, a few different sales calls, um, it's it's okay to to lose some, right? I mean, a thirty percent booking rate is that's like that's a that's a decent batting average in the MLB, which means that most of those are strikes. Okay, um, most of them, most inquiries that come in, we decide that you know the couple decides they're not a good fit for us, we're not a good fit for them. The price point's too high. They are looking for a wedding somewhere else. Whatever, it's all good, but. So long as three out of 10 are hitting, um, we're, we're doing pretty well. So test a new price point. See if you can hit that 30% rate. Uh, give it a, get, just do it at least more than once. You know, that's all I'm saying. I think it's, it's, uh, it's scary to float that out there, uh, but just keep in mind, it's, we're all just making this up as we go along. Um, <clears throat> finally, the, um, the more that you are able to make, the more care and love and respect and attention you can provide to your clients. Uh, those two things might seem kind of inverse. We have found uh, that that fact is true in our business, that as we've raised our prices, we've been able to provide a level of service to our clients that uh, increases as years go by. And um, that, that is an effort, that is a conscious effort on our part, but it's also just an accumulation of experience over the years. Uh, which is why you pay more for a senior senior person. So um, I think just in closing, like at the end of the day, uh, you've got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of your clients and then you got to keep the legs moving, right? You got this, you can do it. Uh, if you have any questions, if this stuff is interesting, uh, if you like the video, please leave a comment for us, uh, comment on the blog posts, comment on YouTube, whatever. Uh, if you have any questions, I love talking about this stuff. I don't know if you can tell, I'm, I get uh, I get pretty jazzed about it. I would love to help you walk through uh, whatever kind of questions you have. Can't promise I'll have the answers, but doggone it, I'd love to hear them out and try and provide something. Um, you can email me at jake at wilderweddingsco.com. I'll do my best to get back to you within a business day. Um, and yeah, that's that's all we had for you. Thanks so much for tuning into this webinar. Let us know if it's helpful. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks.